Well, good morning, Grace Vision. I hope everybody can hear me. Can everybody hear me out there? All right, great. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, start up worship today. Well, I've actually pulled out a couple of our Easter songs since we weren't all together on Easter. We're going to pull a couple of those Easter songs out that you guys might not have heard. So uh, this one is going to, this one's called He Lives. So if we can go ahead and stand for worship today and go ahead and get started. Hopefully you can see the lyrics back there, but we'll try One, two, three, four. Jesus. 
Well, good morning. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. I know it's a little warm, um, but we appreciate you being here this morning for our worship. So we want to talk a little bit about next week. So next week we're going back in. Uh, you will see where several churches um, went back today. And um, David and I, when we sat down and we guesstimated getting all our cleaning supplies in, the number of people we had and all this stuff, we decided that the best day for us would be next week. And so one of the things we need you to do is RSVP which service and how many. That will give us a number and how to clean rooms and how to clean the thing and just the transition time. And we're going to pick the brains of some of our pastors that went back this week and learned we did that last week, too, because some went back last week. And so, um, but it will be great to be back inside. And, um, you know, it's going to get to that time of year where it will be hard to sit out here at 11 o'clock because it's going to be warm. But uh, we appreciate you all being here. The other thing is notice some of our small groups have come back. Um, and you can tell everybody, Shane, is, is CR, are we inviting everybody now? So Tuesdays. So, you know, if you know people, especially during this time, that have been struggling, a lot of things going on, invite them to come back on Tuesdays. Um, we eat at 6, program starts at 6.30, 7.30, and then small groups. So, um, you know, that's another thing. The other thing is with our um, Sunday schools and our other stuff, I know we're starting to come back, we're starting to meet, we're starting confirmation back next week, and we're going to meet in person. Beth's got some stuff planned to put some kids in the garden and do some, not put them in the ground in the garden, just put them in the garden um, to do that. And some of the youth have been, yeah, some of the youth have been very active in getting back together and starting um, different stuff. And uh, so anyway, but let Candy know so that we can put you in the different rooms. Now, saying that next week, we're going to have people that say, why can't I sit there? Or why can't I do that? And we're just telling everybody, look, we'll get back to normal at some point. But right now, we're going to just have to do things the way we're doing it. So when we come in, we'll enter through right here. This gives a lot of the parking. We'll have the golf cart if somebody can't walk or they're handicapped um, to the point where if they have to park in the back, we'll be able to shuttle them up to the, um, to the door. And um, we'll come in through this way. Now, we'll do temperature checks and mask, and then uh, we'll be in worship. So people have asked me about what it looks like. Um, we're not going to have a full choir yet. Um, just, just not going to do that yet. But we've got some special music that different ones have already signed up for and that are doing. So anyway, well, enough of that. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time we can come together. God, we thank you for your saving grace. God, it's been a tumultuous week. Um, and God, we need your spirit to come and abide with us and for us. God, we pray for the others that are worshiping today. God, it's so good to see cars and to see people. God, it's been hard the last few months preaching to, to empty pews, even though we know people were out there watching. And God, we know we were made for worship. That's just what the scripture says. I mean, Moses looked... And he could have given anything, could have done anything. But he asked God one thing. He said, God, show me your glory. He did that because he wanted to know how to worship. God, we were created to worship. So God, I pray now that that's what we do by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and worship with us.
He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Or on media, are, are just it's just been an uh, influx of people that, that um, have passed away. But we, we definitely want to remember those in our prayers. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for letting us come to worship. And God, we ask your prayers for these. We ask your prayers for Barbara and Doyce, for the Kessler family, and for David and Megan. God, we can only imagine what they're going through. And so, God, we just pray that you'd be with them. God, that you would guide and comfort them. God, we don't really have the words or any answers, but that you'd be with them. God, we know that there have been a lot of people during this week and weeks leading up that have been anxious and overwhelmed, just trying to sort through and figure out God, what we're going to talk about today is so essential, and that is being able to pray. And God, we don't have to pray in the King James Version or American Standard Version or NIV. We just pray with our voice. God, we just lift you up. God, you just want to hear from your people. God, you said whatever it is, by prayers and petitions, bring to me. God, you're a listening God. And God, you're an acting God. God, I pray your blessing upon our nation, even in the midst of all that's going on. 
God, I pray for our leaders, both from city all the way up to the national status. I pray for our first responders. I pray for those that are involved in movements and other things that are going on. And God, we ask that you would give us rest and peace in our hearts. And now we pray with the confidence that you taught your disciples to pray, saying these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So at this time, we want to mention, of course, uh, have our offertory invitation and prayer. Um, you know, you can continue to give online. You can continue to uh, uh, drop checks by the church. I don't know who has our basket today. We have one out here. We didn't bring one today. Okay, we can just give it to give it to David. David's going to throw it up, and what God doesn't catch, he's going to keep, he said. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I better not do it. Oh, Beth's got the basket. So see Beth. Um, so we want to just say a thank you to so many people because um, y'all have been so faithful during this to continue to give, and um, we are seeing the Lord work. Um, I'm going to be honest. We were nervous, nervous, nervous when this first started, and not necessarily so nervous on the church side, but on the day school side. I don't think people understand what a true, and I, I mean ministry that is, for this whole community. And uh, we were able, of course, to get the stimulus. And now that we found out that's going to probably be more weeks, we're going to be able to, uh, to, to hire most of our teachers back. And um, there are some that have chosen not to come back. And some, um, maybe because of health, underlying health issues, chose that. And so um, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for giving, and thank you for caring, and thank you for your tithes and offerings. God, I just ask a blessing upon these gifts, these tithes, and these offerings. Multiply them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue worship. You guys can go ahead and stay seated for this one. One of my favorite songs, I Got Saved. Um, we have Chris Eubanks coming back to sing for us, which has been a while since we've seen him, so it's great to have him back. Thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and lead this up. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of the past are broken and last. I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I've received nothing but goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone. Of Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. You got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? The love of God gave me His pardon. The love of God won't let me stay the same. 
The love of God calls me up higher. His will is stronger. That's why I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus, I could I want more. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus, I could I want more. I've got Jesus. But I want so much on my own. Can you hear me? I don't know if I'm on. Can you hear me? Everybody says you can't. Okay, good. I can hear myself now. Good. Well, I just want to thank the Grace Vision Band. It's so good to have Chris back up here and Kirkland back here playing. Yes. Let's give him another round of applause. I don't know if you think about it, but they have really had to do a lot of work over the last several months to pull off worship for Grace Vision each and every Sunday. And just look at all the equipment, everything they had to bring out so that you could worship in person. Uh, so anytime you see them one-on-one, -on -one, just tell them how much you appreciate them and uh, how meaningful it is for you to be able to worship in person. Well, this morning we're reading from um, 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 5 through 9. If you got your Bible handy on a phone or an iPad app, you can read along or just listen as I read. In the same way, you who are hungry must accept the authority of the elders, the younger, excuse me, must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we have read from your word this morning, we pray that you can just open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls to receive a new lesson of faith. Fill us with your spirit, guide us in your wisdom, for it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. I don't know about you, but um, when I first saw the sermon title Steve came up with, Praying Through the Pain, I had a reaction. I thought, um, I don't want to pray through the pain. Uh, I want the pain alleviated first, then I'll pray. Um, any of y'all have that same kind of reaction when you're thinking about it? How many times have we said that at one time or another? God, I'll grow deeper in the relationship I have with you once this trial or this tribulation or this challenge is over. Then I'll move on and I'll, I'll go more to small groups. I'll attend worship more. I'll read my Bible more. But first, just get me through whatever it is I'm going through and then we'll move on. Think about all those different times when you've got a pounding headache that will not go away. The last thing on your mind is to pray. Or when you've got a toothache that is keeping you up at night and you're unable to sleep, the last thing you want to do is carry your concerns to God. Or when your muscles are inflamed and sore from an intense workout or working out in the yard all day, the last thing you want to do is try to get into a posture of prayer. Or when things aren't working out in a relationship, you don't really want to involve God as a third party to try to mediate your differences or your conflicts. You just want things to be resolved or ended. Or when a loved one has been diagnosed with some sort of cancer or illness, you don't really want to take time to pray. You just want God to deliver the cure in the moment. 
Oh, sure, when we face any of these maladies or these issues, we may cry out, oh, God, heal us, or oh, God, work in this situation. But really, it's more of a demand than it is a prayer. So what's the point of prayer? And how do we go about praying through the pain, especially when we don't want to? Well, prayer is about our relationship with God and with each other. Praying is a reminder that we are not alone through any moment in this life. God is with us. Prayer is this moment in which if we've experienced isolation or loneliness and then all of a sudden a friend calls or texts us or comes by for a visit, our spirits are lifted up and we realize, hey, there are people in this world that care about me. That is the power of prayer. It's not that your friend, when they visit or they call or they text, do something miraculous or amazing. It's simply that they showed up in your life and they were present. Prayer is also a reminder that there is someone who completely knows and understands everything there is to know and understand about you, and they still love you anyway. How many of you spouses can say that, right? Your wives or your husbands, they know you really well, and they love you despite all your flaws and your imperfections. Well, the same is true with God. Remember what the scripture says in Psalm 139, 1 through 6. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And then Jeremiah 12, 3 says, But you, O Lord, know me. You see me. You test my heart toward you. And then remember what Romans 5, 8 tells us. But God demonstrates his own love for us. And while this, we were still sinners, but Christ died for us. And 1 John 3, 1, verse 16 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for all of us. In Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, but this is a gift of God. These are just a few of the many verses in the Old and New Testament that tells us that God knows everything there is to know about us, who we are, what we think, what we do, and still God loves us. It's terrifying and soothing to know that God knows this much about us and he still loves us and still wants to be in a relationship with us. But that is just who God is. And that's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. And what can be more comforting than that, to know that even when we mess up and we look around and wonder who's standing with us, God's still right there, right beside us, walking with us through the storm. Prayer also reminds us that someone cares about us and what we are going through without necessarily trying to fix the problem. So often when we go to God, we think we're going for a quick fix to our situation, when a lot of times what we really are going to God for is for someone to listen, to hear us out, and to give us space to articulate what's going on, what's bothering us, and why. Yes, on occasion God may intervene, and we are excited about that, but more times than not, we just want to know that someone is listening and someone cares. How many times have we found ourselves going to our spouse or friend or neighbor and we're trying to share our troubles or our burdens with them and all of a sudden they interrupt us to tell us how to fix the problems and that really doesn't help us out, does it? We just want them to listen and to be there for us. Finally, prayer lets us know that someone is there with us when we need them the most. A few years ago when I was serving a church in Gunnersville, I met a lady named Pam and she was a children's minister at the church. And Pam was sharing with me the year before she was in a terrible accident. Pam was uh, one of the workers at the Child Advocacy Center in Gunnersville in downtown. And every morning she had to drive across the bridge into the office. And every morning she was driving directly into the rising sun. And so just like a blinding game just to get, make it across the bridge safely. Well, that morning she didn't make it safely across the bridge. She was going across and this truck in front of her was carrying a heavy load with equipment hanging off the back and it hit its brakes and she didn't see that. And all of a sudden, all that equipment came crashing through her window and it hit her in the face, ripping off half her face and knocking out her eye. Well, as anyone would be, she was terrified and shaking and she was going into shock 
until all of a sudden this woman runs up to her window and grabs her hands and starts praying with her. That woman just happened to be Lisa, who is another member of the same church. Talk about the way God works, right? So she just started praying over Pam. And then another woman named Christy runs up to the other window and she comes into the car and she grabs Chris, uh, Pam's head and cradles it in her arms and tells her it's going to be okay. Well, that individual just happened to be married to another pastor in the community. Talk about the way that God was working in this story. So as Pam is there, she says she was shivering and she was cold and that's the sign she's going into shock. And then all of a sudden as they're praying for her and they're cradling her head in her arms, she says she felt this warmth on her body, like they had placed a blanket on her. And she realized that God had sent these angels just to wrap her in their wings to keep her safe and to protect her. She knew on that day that God was there for her when she needed God the most. And what's amazing is Pam went through several surgeries. She looks fine today. Everything is okay. She has some more surgeries in the future, but she's still alive and well. And she credits that to God and the way God was working in her life. I know you may not can see it on the screen, but go back and look on the Facebook feed later and you can see how totaled her car was and what a miracle it was she was able to walk away from that. Well, recounting a story told by Bill Frey in his book, The Dance of Hope, Max Lucado says one day uh, Bill found this big stump out in the yard and he decided that he was going to dig it up and cut the wood up for firewood. And as he's out there working, he tried everything he could, digging around the stump, prying at the stump, using a crowbar for several hours with no luck. Then one day, his dad was, and was driving, coming home from work. He sees his son out there working. He comes out there, and he's watching his son. And then he says, son, I see your problem. Well, don't you hate that whenever you're trying really hard, and someone comes up and says, I see your problem. And you're like, don't say that. Just let me take care of it. And so he kind of explodes at his dad, and he keeps trying to work at it. And finally, he cools down, and he says, OK, dad, what's my problem? And he says, you're not using all your strength. Oh, that would really infuriate me if somebody said that to me. And it did him too. And he said, what do you mean I'm not using all my strength? I've been out here working on this for hours and using everything I can. He said, no, son, you're not using all your strength. You could ask me for help. I think God is the same way, right? Lucado says, this business of anxiety management is like pulling stumps out of the ground. Some of your worries have deep root systems. Extracting them is hard, hard work. In fact, it may be the toughest challenge of all. But you don't have to do it alone. In today's scripture reading, Paul, uh, Peter says, Cast all your anxiety on God because He cares for you. In other words, because of our relationship with God, we can give everything over to God and trust that we are in good hands. When I read through the scripture this week, I wondered why, why would Peter use this word apart from being a former fisherman, cast all your anxieties on God? Why did he say that? Why did he say cast all your anxieties on God? Well, I think one of the reasons that Peter uses the word cast is because he believes something would return if we cast all of our anxieties on God and we put all of our trust in him. Like a child at a fall festival, it takes that fishing line that has a little clothespin on the end and they throw it over the board that's painted up like water and a little prize is clipped to the bag. Well, for them, they reel it in and they get their little cheap prize or toy and they're so excited you would think they won the lottery. For us, as we cast our anxieties for, onto the Lord, we expect something much more, much deeper, much more profound. Here's the thing with this experience, though. It requires all of us to do a complete casting. You can't just halfway cast out the fishing line or the net and reel it back immediately and expect to get some sort of great cast. You have to leave it out there and wait for the fish to bite, right? And what's really interesting in that analogy is the fact that when you go fishing, sometimes it's not even about catching the fish, is it? All of my fishermen out there and fisherwomen, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's just dwelling out there in the peacefulness of the day, by yourself, communing with nature, communing with God. If you catch a fish, that's great, and it's something to brag about. But still, you're experiencing a peace you can't in other settings. So we have to cast, and we have to wait. And we can find this peace and this joy in the Lord. 
As Okada said, the path to peace is paved with prayer. Less consternation, more supplication. Fewer anxious thoughts, more prayer-filled thoughts. As you pray, the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. And in the end, what could be better? There are some things, though, that can hinder us from finding this peace that God wants us to find. One of those hindrances is holding back our anxiety that we should be casting on God. Maybe we think that God can't handle it all, or maybe we don't think that God cares about a particular situation or circumstance, or God has more things more important to worry about than us and our trivial matters. Or maybe we are afraid of the way that God might respond once we cast our anxiety on Him. No matter what motivates us, we hold on to some anxiety thinking that we can work it out ourselves. And then in that sense, we're never giving it all to God, which means that we can't really experience the peace that God wants us to experience. Remember, when Peter says, cast all your anxiety on God, he means all, everything, every bit of it, leaving nothing out. Cast all your anxiety on God. And writing on the science, psychology, and metaphysics of prayer, Michael J. Formica says, Prayer, like meditation, influences our state of mind, which in turn influences our state of body. It reduces the experience of anxiety. It elevates a depressed mood. It lowers our blood pressure. It stabilizes sleep patterns and impacts autonomic functions like digestion and breathing, further in influencing our state of mind and body. Prayer and meditation also influence our thinking. This prompts a shift in the habits of our mind and subsequently patterns of behavior. These changes in turn and over time induce changes in the brain, further influencing our subjective and our objective experience of the world and how we participate in it. Did you hear all that or make sense of all that? What they're saying is basically that the power of prayer works in our bodies and our minds in such a way that it can heal and restore us in ways that God created us to begin with. Ways in which we can have peace. Ways in which we can have clarity of thought and purpose. Ways in which we can function better in day-to-day -day experiences and relationships with one another. And all of that is as a result of prayer. And one of the things I found fascinating this week as I was studying and thinking about the power of prayer is some studies that were done by Duke University and a couple of other universities. And they were looking at, does prayer really have an impact? And this really blew my mind. There's so much power in praying, even for one another, in intercessory prayer, that they did this experiment and they had this control group that no one was instructed to pray over. Then they had another group of individuals going through similar uh, situations and diagnoses and treatments, and they had people, a congregation, praying over those individuals. And as they tracked their progress, what they noted was a substantial healing in the group that was being prayed over versus the one that had no prayers whatsoever. So there's something powerful in the experience of prayer. Just knowing the physical and the mental benefits of prayers should be enough for us to, to cause us to want to stop and pray. But that's not the case always, is it? We know for quite some time now that there's something important to eating healthy organic foods and to exercising the positive impact that it can have on our bodies, yet most of the time we find ourselves off the wagon than we do on the wagon. We eat tons of processed foods. We leave exercise as the last priority on the list. We want to be healthy, but then we let things get in the way. We let things distract us from what matters the most. The same is true for prayer. We know the value of prayer, especially when we are in pain. But we've grown accustomed to looking for ways to dull the pain rather than praying through it. Distractions can seem like a quick fix, but they're not. They cannot fix what needs healing inside of us. Distractions don't alleviate the pain, the problem, or the concerns of life, and they mask them, and if we leave them unchecked for too long, we may be too far gone. That's why we have to acknowledge and pray through the pain and the anxiety. We can't just hope and ignore that it goes away. But we can give it to God knowing that God cares for us and will get us through it. I don't know what your story is today or what kind of pain you are experiencing right now, but God does. God knows. 
Don't think that you have to carry your pain, your anxiety, all on your own, because you don't. Cast all of your anxiety, all of your pain on God, because He cares for you, and God wants what's best for you even this day. When you cast all of your anxieties on God, when you pray through the pain, you can live through, a pain, uh, through, through the peace that can sustain you through anything. And as you live through that, then you can be anxious for nothing. Let us pray. Gracious God, we all live with anxiety and pain each and every day of life. Too often we try to carry that pain ourselves, that anxiety ourselves, and when we don't have to. Help us to have courage and faith and trust to cast all of our anxieties on you and to leave them there so that we may find the peace of Christ and live in it. For it's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt and
go forward, casting our anxieties on God, living in the peace of Christ, and being anxious for nothing. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We do actually have one other real quick thing we want to do real fast. It is uh, this handsome young man next to me's birthday today. He is our wonderful leader, gets all this together for us, gets everything set for us. He gets a great week at the beach leaving this afternoon, so it's going to be well with his birthday. Can we sing happy birthday to Jeff? Will you join us, please? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. 